Vamos. Come. The game is afoot. Did your clothes and come? Well, I think we have fought sufficiently, Holmes. Splendid. Abbey Grange, Marshall, Kent, 3.30 a.m. My dear Mr. Holmes, I shall be very glad of your immediate assistance in what promises to be a most remarkable case. There is something quite in your line. Except for releasing the lady, I will see that everything is kept exactly as I found it. But I beg you not to lose an instant, as it is difficult to leave so useless there. Yours faithfully, Stanley Hopkins. Ah. Inspector Hopkins. He's called you in seven times. On each occasion, his summons has been entirely justified. I fancy that every one of his cases has found its way into your collection. Mm -hmm. I must admit, Watson, you do have some part of selection. Thank you. It atones for much of which I deplore about your narratives. Your fatal habit of looking at everything from the point of view of a story instead of as a scientific exercise has ruined it. What might have been an instructive and even classical series of demonstrations. Why do you not write them yourself? I will, my dear Watson, I will. In my declining years. So our present research appears to be one of murder. Does it? E. B. Monogram. With arms. An address which harks back to the dissolution of the monasteries. We are moving in high life. Brackenstall. Sir Eustace Brackenstall. You've heard of him? He was quoted in the Chronicle the other day as being one of the richest men in Kent. Watson, you are a treasury of knowledge. And you think him dead? I think him murdered, Watson. Hopkins is not an emotional man. The writing shows a certain agitation. It is surely urgent. Do you think the body left there for our inspection? I think that we shall find the Brackenstall line is now extinct.
very good of you to come, Mr. Holmes. And you, Doctor. Inspector? I, uh, I hope you'll forgive me, Mr. Holmes. Forgive what, Hopkins? I should not have troubled you, sir. But since the lady has come to herself, she's given so clear an account of the affair that well, there's not much left for us to do. You remember the Lewisham gang between the three Randalls? Exactly, sir. The uh, father and two sons. It's their work, not a doubt. But they did a job at Sydney a fortnight ago, didn't they? They did. They were seen and described. Well, it's cool of them. I agree to do another so soon as so near. But it is they. And a hanging matter this time. Rackenstall is dead, then. Ah, yes, Doctor. In the dining room, his head was knocked in with his own poker. And the lady? Not yet, my lady. I shall be glad when you can arrange matters. Oh, what is that? Look, you, you have other injuries, madam. It's nothing. It has no connection with this hideous business. Please sit down. I think it would be best to inform you of something, gentlemen. Regarding Sir Eustace. You'll no doubt hear a rumour of it otherwise from idle tongues who will distort the truth of it. And it would pain me to think of his memory tarnished in that way. Sir Eustace drank, I'm afraid. Not regularly and consistently. Not in a way to hurt our marriage. Nor did it interfere with the exercise of his public duties. Nevertheless, the vice was a private shame to him. He was very sensible of my dislike of it. When he felt the obsession too keenly, he took himself off until the poison had exhausted him. It distressed me, of course, that it should happen. But he was proud and sensitive enough never to allow me to witness it. I felt deep gratitude for that. And not a little pity. Can you understand that, gentlemen? I have never heard a like case talked of with such illuminating compassion, madam. I must, however, ask you to believe something further. I was in some measure grateful for this vice of my husband's. How could that be? I spent most of my life in South Australia, in the wine-growing country near Adelaide. As a very young woman, I lived alone with my father. My mother was dead. If I had a mother, it was my loyal Teresa. It was a very free life. I found it extremely difficult to adapt to the proprieties of England, to being mistress of such a place as this. So I felt if I were to show a decent understanding of my husband's weakness, he would in turn forgive me some of my unsuitable behavior. And so it proved. I see. I'll tell you about last night. Eustace retired at about half past 10. The servants had already gone to their quarters. Which are where? In the east wing. Only my husband, Teresa, and myself sleep in the central block. The servants would have heard nothing. Had you retired by then? I was in my room. I never retired till I've seen Madame to bed. Thank you. I sat up. This room, in fact. It is my custom to walk around to see that the house is secure. 
because for obvious reasons, Sir Eustace is not always to be relied upon in that respect. I went into the gun room, the kitchen, the butler's pantry, the billiard room, the drawing room, and finally, the dining room, where the curtains were drawn. I'll tell you much of what happened next. I took a step towards the curtain. 